Hi, everyone, and welcome to NGV America's inaugural edition of Start Now, RNG is How. My name's Karen Romer. I'm the SVP Communications at Hexagon Group, the proud guest presenters of today's webcast entitled RNG, a Viable Decarbonization Strategy for Medium and Heavy Duty Trucks. I'll moderate today's broadcast from a studio here in Costa Mesa, where Hexagon Agility has its main office. Dan Gage, the president of NGV America, will host today's talk. My colleagues, Ashley Remillard, VP of Legal, and Eric Bippis, SVP of Global Sales in Hexagon Agility, will join us here in studio. The agenda for today's webcast is um, introduction by Dan, and then a presentation by Eric, followed by Ashley, and then Dan will lead a discussion, and we will invite you, the audience, to participate in that discussion. And we'll wrap up at the end of that. My, by audience participa participation, we mean you. You have an opportunity to shape the discussions, so please don't be shy. You can see the Q&A field on your screen. Please use the Q&A field, not the chat. It will be open throughout the broadcast, so feel free to use it throughout the presentation. Note your questions. If you have any trouble accessing the Q&A field, you can also send an email to ir at hexagongroup.com. I now invite Dan to take the floor. Dan? Thanks. Thanks, Karen. NGV America is a national trade association of sustainability solutionists, experts in the clean transportation field. Our roughly 200 members in the US and Canada are dedicated to the development of a growing, profitable, and sustainable marketplace for vehicles ships and carriers powered by natural gas and biomethane. NGV America member companies produce, distribute, and market natural gas and biomethane across North America, manufacture and service natural gas vehicles, engines, and equipment, and operate fleets powered by clean, burning, gaseous fuels. Our members believe that climate change is real and time is of the essence, that early reductions matter because the results are compounded again and again that the transportation sector can be cleaner and decarbonized, and that renewable natural gas vehicles are an affordable, scalable, and immediate heavy-duty solution to do so. You can find out more about our organization, our, members, our membership opportunities, and our mission at ngvamerica.org. Access today's presentation on our online resource center. You can find it via the QR code displayed on your screen now. Today's broadcast is the first in a series of webinars, report releases, and virtual events entitled Start Now, RNG is How, a year-long project by NGV America. Over the next hour, we'll review the global climate challenge before us and detail how renewable natural gas is an evolving, inclusive, long-term, no-regret transportation fuel solution with immediate impact. We'll discuss the affordable medium and heavy-duty technologies available for development now, the upcoming regulatory and market forces requiring fleets of all sizes to decarbonize their operations, and the climate and clean air impact those investments can have today. Fueling with RNG, fleets don't just avoid emissions, they actively remove them from the environment, supporting the transition to a circular, carbon-neutral economy. It's a pleasure to partner on our kickoff event with NGV America member Hexagon Agility, and to welcome Eric Bippis and Ashley Remillard to our program. Eric? Thanks, Dan. On behalf of Hexagon Group and Hexagon Agility, I just want to say thank you for this invitation. Uh, we're excited to be here. We're very passionate about this topic, renewable natural gas, and uh, we look forward to this conversation. So a little bit about Hexagon and Hexagon Agility. Our mission is clean air everywhere. We believe that clean air is a right, not a privilege, and we're very passionate about taking that globally. When we look at the two businesses within the Hexagon Group that are focused in the heavy-duty transport sector and making an impact today, the first is under Hexagon Agility, which is our G-Mobility business that I work in and represent. That's our low-emission business focusing on compressed natural gas, LPG, and biogas and renewable natural gas solutions. Our sister company, Hexagon Purus, is focused on e-mobility and zero emission battery electric solutions, complete battery vehicle integration, as well as hydrogen solutions for passenger car right up on through heavy duty vehicles. And combined, the two businesses today have over 70,000 alt fuel clean energy vehicles on the road today globally. We take a look at Hexagon's global footprint. We have production facilities in North America, as well as Europe, along with engineering facilities. 
and then we have sales representation in North America, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. When we take a look at our product portfolio, we're truly an agnostic supplier of energy solutions. So in the automotive and heavy duty transport sector, we have hydrogen solutions, biogas, RNG, CNG, LPG, and pure BEV through the two brands as I stated. In addition to that, and relevant for today's conversation is our mobile pipeline business, which has seen a significant uptick in the last 24 to 36 months, supporting renewable natural gas where you have stranded gas in locations that needs to get to pipelines or processing locations. We also have business in maritime and rail, ground storage, and LPG, household and leisure, small propane tanks. Now let's talk about what is relevant for today's topic, and that is what do we manufacture that can solve some of the needs we have. Today's conversation is going to be around heavy duty transport, specifically in the North American market. So within class eight, class seven and eight, day cab, as I'm showing here, as well as sleeper applications. So Hexagon Agility manufactures our ProCab 175 back of cab system. That's designed for a day cab application that typically would have 60 to 100,000 miles per year in range requirements. We manufacture type four cylinders. So we're the largest manufacturer of composite type four cylinders in the world with manufacturing both in North America and in Europe. We take those cylinders anywhere from 3,200 bar PSI right on up in the purest range in, in hydrogen, 10,000 PSI systems. And we package those inside of a fuel system for back of cab applications, rail mount applications, and we do that. Uh, in the United States, Germany, Norway, and for the purest business, we do it for hydrogen up in Kelowna, Canada. We, take a, we also have a partnership with Truck Labs Truck Wings, where we take a, 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 a system we put on the back of our Pro Cab, and it allows us to achieve 4 to 6 percent better fuel efficiency because we're closing that gorilla gap that exists between the cab and the trailer at highway speed. So we're always looking at ways that we can improve the efficiency of our system, reduce the fuel used, and therefore reduce emissions. When we look at the sleeper cab, and this is a real opportunity in North America because this is dominated by diesel, it's 99.9% .9 diesel today. The class eight sleeper, there's about 200 to 250,000 in a normal production year that are sold into the North American marketplace every year. Range annual requirements can be anywhere from 100,000 miles per year, right on up to 200, even 250, if the fleet operation is slip seating drivers. We have our dual back of cab systems. We have back of cab with wings and dual side mount 45 DGE systems that we can provide over 1,200 mile range for this application. And we'll talk to you about some of the new technology under the hood that Cummins is introducing to really go after this market in 2023 and 2024. So what does that mean for the fleet today and what Hexagon has to offer? If you look at the companies in the middle, UPS, Amazon, FedEx, Frito-Lay, operations like that that have multi-mode transportation requirements, it could be day cab class eight, we have our pro cab 175. For cross country uh, long haul class eight sleeper, we have our combo system of to over 1200 miles range. For yard trucks on distribution centers where fleets have put in CNG filling infrastructure, we can run them off of the yard trucks off of compressed natural gas or renewable natural gas. And then for final mile, the packages that are being delivered to your home, we also have, we're putting about 2,000 package cars on the road every year. And then our team over at Puris, you've probably seen some announcements as of late, over $2 billion in commitments from OEMs over the last couple of months for BEV and hydrogen solutions. So really, we're, we're the consultative fleet supplier of complete solutions for today the near-term future, and well into the future. So let's focus on today's conversation and the sense of urgency that we had. Back in the fourth quarter of last year, a lot of countries came together at COP26 for, for a climate summit, and they really pulled the, the targets forward to 2030, getting very aggressive, wanting a reduction of 30% by 2030, which means we need to take a look at the sectors that we can change now, not wait for science projects and, and technologies to evolve over the next five or 10 years, we need to implement now. And if you look at heavy duty transport, 20% of global CO2 emissions come from heavy duty transport. On average, there's 350,000 heavy duty transport vehicles that are sold in North America, of which 97% today are still diesel, which is the point of our conversation today. Hexagon Agility commissioned a study last year to take a look at the RNG market. There's been a huge uptake in North America and in Europe on RNG, and we wanted to look at, understand through a third-party source, 
whether there is enough potential biomass waste in the marketplace to support this market moving forward in the heavy duty transport sector. So some of the things we tried to accomplish and we'll, we'll try to accomplish today are, number one, is there with RNG a sufficient greenhouse gas reduction? Number two, if there is, is there enough supply? Will be there enough biomass available globally and more specifically in the North American market to support the heavy duty transport sector? Third, is technology in place or do we have to wait? Do we have to wait for OEMs to release product? Do we have to wait for infrastructure to be in place? Ashley's gonna come talk to us about what's going on with supportive regulation around the world. And then finally, none of this makes sense if the TCO doesn't pay off. We know that in order to achieve mass adoption, there has to be an ROI for the fleet to sustain this. So let's dive in. And by the way, as Dan said earlier and Karen said, we're gonna leave time at the end of this for questions and answers, so please, if you have questions, submit those. And this presentation will be available. There's a lot of content we're gonna cover. I'm just gonna hit the highlights, and then we'll circle back at the end. So let's take a look at greenhouse gas reduction of RNG. First off, to be clear, Renewable natural gas is produced from waste, not from crops. So it's not a, a food crop that could be used to supply product or, or feed families, to feed nations. It is truly waste product that either could come from livestock, could come from crop waste, could be in a landfill. And through anaerobic digestion and further processing, it's converted, meaning the methane is captured from escaping into the atmosphere, where, by the way, it's 30 times more potent than CO2 although it lasts for a shorter period in the atmosphere, it's 30 times more potent than um, CO2. So taking a look at that, when we get a lot of questions around renewable natural gas, well, do you have renewable natural gas systems? Do you have you know, compressed natural gas systems? It's the same. It's the methane molecule. It's just a different source, whether it's geologic natural gas or crop-based natural gas. There's no difference in the systems. So looking at the greenhouse gas reduction and, and taking a look at what that means, up in the top of this graph, you will see RNG. You'll see natural gas in the bluish, uh, the geologic natural gas, which is about a 15 to 18% uh, improvement over that red line, which is diesel, the, the baseline. So 663 grams per kilometer is emitted from a, a fossil diesel or geologic diesel. When you look at geologic natural gas, you get about an 18% improvement right away. When you start looking at RNG, especially RNG that comes from manure, it's a 200% improvement over diesel, and even RNG from crop waste, wastewater, landfill, is still at least an 80% improvement over diesel. The exciting thing is when you look at it compared to the EU grid in 2019, nothing has, has the negative sink that RNG from manure has, and even brown electricity and coal, you can see it's extremely dirty. Hydrogen from natural gas, is about the same as geologic natural gas and even green hydrogen and wind power has some sort of emission in the creation of the equipment to create that. So if we were to look at all the available sources of energy to be supplied to the heavy duty sector, the cleanest by far today is renewable natural gas. So we tick the box and say, yes, it's very clean. Now we have to say, okay, but is there enough? Is there enough available to really make an impact? So to do that, we have to define how much energy is required for the heavy duty transport sector. And we're gonna use a term called exajoule, which is basically 1,018 joules of energy required. And if we look at the North American marketplace and specifically the targeted sector that we're looking at is the heavy duty transport sector, North America requires approximately five exa exajoule or EJ of energy per year to meet that demand. So that's the basis and the scope of what we're gonna talk about when it comes to biomass supply and RNG. Taking a look, the study determined that if you look globally, there's about 30 exajoules of demand in the heavy duty transport sector globally, uh, North America, Europe, and rest of the world, but there's about 31 exajoules of biomass, meaning waste product that's out there in, WHO is in EPA in North America stating that they expect a 59% growth in waste creation between now and 2050. So we've got a waste problem and we've got an emissions problem. It makes perfect sense to use the waste to reduce the emission problems. When we look at North America, we see the demand for the heavy duty transport sector to be five exajoule. But as the study calculated, there's about seven exajoule of biomass available. When we look at that further and break that down of where it's coming from, 
Today, North America produces less than one exajoule of renewable natural gas. So it's virtually an untapped market, 70x growth of the total seven. Wastewater is a little less than uh, one exajoule. Landfill waste is about 1.3. These numbers are rounded. Manure is about 1.9. And then agricultural waste is four, making that seven. When we look at that more specifically, we're being realistic here and saying, some of this is very hard to get to. So this graph shows of the 31 exajoule that's available globally, about 17% is relatively easy to get at. And that would be wastewater and landfill biomass that is probably near pipeline or close to pipeline. It's easily processed and easily accessed. So that's the 17% that we have circled here to say, if we can access that, could we feed the heavy duty transport sector in the various markets such as the EU and North America? And the determination of the study is, yes, we can, and we can support that market, and we'll give you some of the numbers on that. So we've determined that there's enough biomass potentially available with significant growth possibilities into the future to support RNG supporting the heavy duty transport sector. Now let's take a look at technology. What sort of technology is required to do that? Today, as we said, we're agnostic when we look at our solutions. So BEV today, and, and what we're trying to do is be realistic in upfront capital costs of a vehicle and not degrade the performance, meaning you're gonna put 10, 15, 20 battery packs under this vehicle, and yes, you can get range, but the cost of it's prohibitive. Today's electric uh, Class A truck, 200 to 250 mile range with realistic battery packs. In hydrogen, you can go 400 to 500 miles. You start getting into some cost on the system on those. Today's natural gas solutions, the back of cab solutions we have are about 850 miles range. And then we spoke about sleepers. All of this depends on payload too. If you're hauling potato chips, it's a lot different than if you're hauling steel and there's differences. Yes, we can easily get 500 miles in a BEV solution, but it's gonna require a thousand kilowatt battery pack. And then hydrogen, we can absolutely pack more hydrogen on there, but you're gonna be taking up more space and you're gonna be having more capital upfront cost. Not to mention in both cases that the North American marketplace is not ready to support an electrical grid that would require one class eight truck having the same electrical consumption in a day as 29 to 30 homes. And on, on hydrogen, the infrastructure for hydrogen filling is still a long way off on development. The study concluded that if we were to look at natural gas, we look at BEV, hydrogen, where does it make most sense now through 2030 and even beyond for the particular energy sources to solve. And we believe there's not one solution, there's multiple solutions and we should access those in parallel. So you can see here, the study determined that in city hall applications, BEV makes a lot of sense. We, we, we know that we can achieve 200, 250 mile range. In LCV, your energy requirements are a lot less than when you look at heavy duty truck down on the bottom where you could have a 80,000 GVW and need 500 to 800 miles a day in range if it's a sleeper application. So the study determined that for com compressed natural gas, the real sweet spot is down in the lower right. That high payload, long haul application. And by the way, in that application in North America, there's 200 to 250,000 heavy duty trucks per year that go into that marketplace. So that's really the target market and the sweet spot for a renewable natural gas solution. So, is it available? If I'm a fleet and I want to access it, do I have an issue that it's not available? Today, as we stand, looking at across the multi-mode different platforms that there are, heavy-duty truck, refuse, bus and coach, and medium-duty, in North America, there's over 100 OEM available platforms in compressed natural gas solutions by the various OEMs that you see at the bottom, Volvo, Mack, Kenworth, Freightliner, and the transit OEMs, as well as Europe. And we'll talk to you about OEMs releasing more platforms to cover more of the applications in this space. So we took the box, technology is in place, supply potential is there, it has excellent greenhouse gas reductions. Now I'm gonna ask Ashley Remillard to come up and tell us what's going on with the regulatory environment. Thank you, Eric. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about the RNG regulatory landscape and how RNG is essential to achieving global emission goals. So to start, um, Eric, we already mentioned this, but we have the COP26, which was a global co climate conference held back in October and November of 2021. 
And what was, what was interesting about this particular conference is the Global Methane Pledge. Over 111 countries promised to cut methane emissions by at least 30% by 2030. Not 2040, not 2045, 2030, which is a, an aggressive deadline, kind of unprecedented um, in these types of global conferences. Then in the U.S., Biden unveiled the U.S. Methane Emissions Reduction Action Plan, capitalizing on what happened at COP26, uh, committing to reduce methane emissions by 30 percent below 2020 levels by 2030. And I guess, it, again, it's a sense of urgency, this 2030 deadline that is right around the corner. It's, you know, it's, it's only a few years from now, and we need to act now if we're going to achieve these goals. So in the EU, we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the EU today. Um, it, it largely informs what happens in North America and vice versa. In the European Union, we have the European Green Deal. Um, it is the first continental um, commitment to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. It was adopted back in December of 2019, and the goal is to achieve no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. Then that started as kind of a target, and then that was codified as law via the European Climate Law, which was just enacted, um, so it's now a legally binding um, requirement um, back in uh, July of 2021. And then we have Fit for 55, and I think we'll talk a little bit about this, but this is the legislative tool that delivers on the European Climate Law, and that package also came out in July of 2021. So what is Fit for 55? There's been a lot of noise about, in Europe in particular, about the end of the internal combustion engine. And I want to kind of debunk that myth today. Um, what is Fit for 55? Yes, there is a reduction target of 100% for passenger cars and light commercial vehicles by 2035. What it does not apply to is the medium and heavy duty segment. There's kind of interim targets, uh, reduction of 55% um, by 2030 and 50% um, for vans by 2030. But it, again, it does not apply to the medium and heavy duty segment. Segment, In contrast, there is a regulation in the EU, the Heavy Duty Fleet Emission Reduction Regulation, that applies specifically to the medium and heavy duty sector. That was adopted back in 2019. Um, it does have two uh, binding reduction targets for OEMs, a 15% reduction by 2025, a 30% reduction by 2030. But that is all going to be under review this year. In December, um, they're going to com uh, commission and prepare a report by the end of um, 2022, and then a new regulatory proposal will come out in 2023. So you're seeing two different regulatory schemes, one devoted to passenger cars and light commercial vehicles, which as Eric said, like there's, there's a place for, for battery electric vehicles in that space, that makes sense. However, on the medium and heavy duty side, they have a different regulatory scheme that doesn't have the same type of targets, it's being treated differently. So what does infrastructure look in the, like in the EU? Um, it's very well developed. Uh, they actually just reached a milestone with 500 LNG stations in Europe as of February of 2022. This was the result of the Advanced Fuel Infrastructure Directive. It's been in place for many years, since October of 2014. It requires one uh, LNG fueling station every 400 kilometers. Um, that target was retained in Fit for 55. So now you can see the numbers. There's over um, close to 4,000 CNG fueling stations in Europe and 500 LNG stations. I would note that the 500 LNG stations are specifically reserved for and intended for the medium and heavy duty sector. So the infrastructure supports adoption of RNG as well. So the, the OEMs are kind of seeing the writing on the wall from this regulatory, these regulatory initiatives. And Scania has now introduced a new 13 liter gas engine for kind of the coach transit um, upper, uh, applications. Um, and, and I think the, the OEMs are, are seeing that RNG is the path forward in Europe. There's the regulatory support, there's the infrastructure support, and now the OEMs are, are buying into that um, support uh, from a regulatory perspective. So what does the United States look like? In the United States, the federal government has committed to be net zero by 2050. Uh, 16 states in Puerto Rico have enacted legislation establishing greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements. Those are actually actual requirements. Even more states, I think it's over 25, have set forth um, goals, emission reduction goals. And then we have the EPA Renewable Fuel Standard, which I'll talk about more in a moment. 
So something that is very unique to the United States is this RNG credit system. And these are environmental credits are generated when RNG is used as a transportation fuel. And then the cre credits are transacted between producers, brokers, and what are so-called obligated parties, which are the petroleum importers, the refiners, and the wholesalers. And then all together, the, the goal is to reduce the carbon intensity of the fuel pool. So the Renewable Fuel Standard is the, the program run by US EPA that sets volume requirements of renewable fuels for the obligated parties. And then we have Renewable Identification Numbers, or RINs, which are the credits, and they have financial value, they're issued under the RFS, and they're tradable commodities. They're essentially the currency of the RFS program. And they act as proof that the equivalent of a gallon of renewable natural gas has been injected into the pipeline. In, in the state of California, we have what's a, kind of an equivalent program called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard. I mean, actually, Oregon and Washington also have programs that are similar. Um, I think Washington was very recently adopted. Um, comparing these programs to, to the EU, back to the EU, the EU does, EU does not have this type of, of uh, kind of robustness of a program in place. They, they have some kind of renewable fuel transport certificates in some countries, such as the UK and Germany, but they're looking to see, to model what they've done in the, U, um, model in the EU, what has been done in the United States, because it has been so successful in kind of um, accelerating the use of RNG. So to speaking to that and the success of it, the, in California, the California Air Resources Board released its data for the LCFS program for Q1 to Q3 of 2021. And that data confirmed that the carbon intensity of all natural gas reported in the California LCFS program was negative, negative 28.17. This is the last year we it dipped in 2020, it dipped slightly into the negative, but the, the percentage and the accumulation, 20, 28 is, it's kind of, it's earth shattering. It's the, it's, it really solidifies that natural gas vehicles provide the greatest greenhouse gas emission benefits compared to all other transportation fuels. And why is this? A lot of it comes from dairy. As, as Eric was mentioning, manure provides the, the greatest carbon intensity um, advantage, and that is the, the kind of the foundation of, of many um, sources of RNG. Um, so what is the, Infrastructure look like in North America, it is also very well, well developed. Um, there's over 1,500 CNG stations, 115 LNG um, stations across the country. Uh, I think the, 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 there's a, quite a few in um, California as well as other states throughout the country, but there's always access to RNG and, and it's something that the, the fleets have been able to capitalize on as RNG adoption grows. And with that, checking the, checking the regulatory box, I will hand it back to Eric. Thanks, Ashley. Some exciting stuff going on in Europe. And just to note, in Europe, the adoption of heavy-duty transport with natural gas is 3x what we have here in North America. They'll exceed 10,000 units over the next 12 months. So let's take a look. This doesn't matter, as I said earlier, if the TCO doesn't pay out. The fleet has to be able to do their operation and do that in a financially beneficial way. It cannot be subsidized forever. So let's take a look at what the study found from a TCO standpoint. Part of the TCO is making sure that there's platforms available. You've probably heard already, and we're very excited about the Cummins 15-liter launch, which really addresses a hole that we've had in the North American marketplace in that class eight sleeper market where we didn't have a 500 to over 500 horsepower solution, 1,850 foot-pounds of torque. So the 15-liter will be coming into operation, probably test trials later this year, and then late 2023, 2024 production. So very excited about that, that rounds out the technology portfolio and really allows fleets to adopt a technology that will achieve full coverage. So let's talk about volatility, let's talk about TCO, a lot of things going on in the global marketplace, but if this is a look back to 2011, the red line shows diesel price over that time, and it's a highly volatile commodity. The black would represent CNG price, that's average pump price in North America. And over that time, you can see great fluctuations in the price of diesel, where CNG remains relatively flat. This report comes from the EIA and the Department of Energy. And you can see last October, when last time this report was created, diesel was at an average of 348 per gallon. Compressed natural gas was at 263 per gallon. Yet today, it's now $4.10. So even since this report was done, the gap has spread even more 
Compressed natural gas is roughly the same. There's been a slight uptick, but it's not much off of the 263 of what it was in October. So a lot of volatility when it comes to diesel fuel and projecting what the future may hold, which makes it a challenge for fleets to run their business and understand what operating costs will be in the near future. So the study validated the fact that if we were to look out to 2030 and try to understand what the cost of the fuel loan would be, the dashed line shows what renewable natural gas, compressed natural gas is today in comparison to diesel at the October price. So that's the lower price than today, the $3.68 price. Where electricity BEV is at today, which is about 30% higher than diesel with the limited range. And then assuming there was a sufficient supply of hydrogen for the heavy duty market, where that would be today, and that's about 215% higher than diesel. And then you can see some of the projections of what hydrogen will have to do from now through 2030 to come on par. It's a significant reduction, so the supply is going to have to improve. The nature of it being from brown hydrogen to green hydrogen is going to have to improve significantly, not to mention the infrastructure fill out. But you can see that RNG and CNG is that steady line projected out from now to 2030, which allows the fleet to say, if I'm going to invest in a technology that's going to have a significant greenhouse gas reduction, and I'm going to have stability in price of fuel for now through 2030, RNG and compressed natural gas is the way to go. So what does that mean from a volume standpoint? And the study concluded from a volume standpoint, if we're to look at the supportive regulation that we have around renewable natural gas and compressed natural gas today, maintaining through 2030, the green bar up top shows that there's a potential, they, they believe that 14% of 2030 sales could be natural gas. Doesn't sound like a lot, the gray is still diesel and you can see from 2023 on uh, EV and hydrogen starting to get some of the share and their growth goes out in, in subsequent decades. But what does that translate to from a unit sales? That means by 2025 we could be approaching 30,000 heavy duty vehicles, 27,700 and 50,000 uh, in 2030 going into the marketplace. That's up from about 6,000 vehicles today. If you look at the full potential, mean RNG is really supportive from a legislative standpoint and we really access more RNG in the marketplace, it could be as high as 35% in 2030, meaning the heavy duty park would be 128,000 vehicles in 2030. And by the way, in order to do that, we're not saying you have to access, they're not saying you have to access all of that biomass less than 10% of the biomass that is available would have to be accessed to achieve that 14%. Here's another study from H2 Accelerate. It was a white paper that was done in Europe with Daimler, Iveco, OMV, Shell, Total Energies, and the Volvo Group. And it said, if you were to look out, non-legislative, out into 2050, and to look at the technologies that are available today and in the future, what would your product portfolio look like? And what it determined was, the internal combustion engine, and you can see from 2040 on, it's running on renewable natural gas and e-fuels and hydrogen, does not die. That there is a need in those high payload, long haul applications that they foresee that lasting into the future with clean fuel technology. Yes, battery electric and fuel cell electric take a big chunk of the marketplace, but you see diesel and gasoline going away and RNG and e-fuels sustained into the future. And we'll give you access to this report uh, on the QR code as well. So to conclude, the study determined we have no supply constraints, 65% uh, RNG supply potential required for over 100% of the commercial transport, less than 10% of the biomass needs to be accessed and converted into RNG to hit some of those targeted numbers in 2030. It's by far, RNG by far has the highest carbon abatement, minimum of 200% if it's off manure, 80% uh, reduction off of crop waste. It's competitive today estimating a 15% lower TCO versus diesel today, and we believe through 2040 and beyond. And then absolutely it's a mature technology, meaning if you're a fleet that wants to act today, there's OEM platforms warranted by OEMs, there's infrastructure in place, and there's a, a sufficient fuel supply in place to support your needs. My, my favorite quote is a quote from uh, Carlton Rose at UPS. He said, UPS will not wait for perfect to arrive when good is already there. And with that, Dan, we'll close our presentation and hand it to you for questions. Okay, this Karen. is um, the opportunity now where um, you should use uh, the Q&A um, section of the um, broadcast to send your questions in. But while we are waiting for you to join the conversation, 
Um, Dan will now lead a, a discussion based on the information presented. So over to you, Dan. Thank you. Um, we heard today an awful lot about transportation solutions and their environmental footprint. We argue at NGV America that the complete life cycle of every energy source has to be, source has to be considered. And it's more than just a tailpipe. And so when you're considering more than just the tailpipe, you're talking about the extraction or the production of the source material, the equipment that's needed to do that. You're talking about the generation of the energy, the resulting emissions of that fuel, right? And then the waste disposal and the, um, of the byproducts when those <coughs> products, the fuel or the battery or the vehicle is end of its life cycle, right? What happens to that equipment? How does Ashley RNG differ from some of the other alternative energy sources on that front? And, and what, in that way, how does it make RNG so well suited for medium and heavy duty? Thanks, Dan. That's a great question. So there's there's actually a lot there's a lot of aspects to that, and there's a lot of answers, right? So RNG is a domestic source. It's a domestic fuel source. It is produced here in North America, and as Eric mentioned earlier, we have a waste crisis. There, and RNG is a, is a solution by literally turning waste into energy. RNG comes from organic waste, such as wastewater. It comes from food waste and landfills, livestock waste, including such as dairies. And every state in the United States is an RNG production site. There are opportunities in rural, suburban, and urban America. The other aspect of that is that RNG creates jobs. We have some great statistics that came from our friends at the Coalition for RNG. And in 2021, RNG contributed over 22,000 jobs and um, 2.6 billion in GDP for the, for the United States economy and 5.4 billion in total business sales for operations and capital expenditures in 2021. Each, every 100 RNG facilities uh, creates 15,000 jobs and supports a total of 1.1 billion in GDP and over 2.5 billion in business sales. Other industry, other types of alternative fuels can't say the same. And why, why is it suited for, especially for the medium and heavy duty sector? I mean, you can add to this, but what we talked about is, is range. There's this, this kind of perfect sweet spot for RNG in the, in, in the um, heavy duty and medium duty long haul sector. And I don't know if you want to add yeah, to that. Yeah, and I'll add to that, you know, in as end of life, we're doing things with technology and end of life to extend the end of life of the systems that they don't have to be scrapped, put into a landfill that can last 20, 25 years and beyond. So really looking at the total cost of ownership, but also the total impact of the environment to say, we love to have the upfront sale. We love to change the emissions that, well, the wheel, but then when that equipment is worn out, what do you do with it? And we're really spending a lot of time uh, looking at how we can extend the life or repurpose a lot of that product as well. Well, Eric, so let's talk a little bit about fleet needs. I mean, we know that every transportation application is unique. Mm -hmm. Every f one fleet need is different regardless of where they or wherever they are in the country. Um, heavy duty freighting especially has some really special needs. And you touched a little bit about some of that on torque and power range. I mean, you have a product that gives you a range of up to 1,500 miles. Yeah. Um, payload, uh, we know that every fleet needs reliability, predictability. They need to be able to go out, start that vehicle, and use it for the full day, the full work day, right? Um, and then a reliable, re resilient fuel source. Viable battery electric options might be existing and, and are continue to be um, uh, brought to market for light and medium duty, or light and last mile delivery. Um, people talk a lot about the advent of long haul trucking and batteries. T talk a little bit about deployability and where we are on that front and, and, and how your scope of product um, meets needs of every fleet today. Yeah, and going back to the one graph that I showed where we kind of walked around the clock and showed the different uh, modes that a fleet could have, and I'll use UPS as an example, but there's many free to lay. The, the, the really leaders in the marketplace saying, we're going to lean forward, we're going to look at these different modes, and we're not just going to look at one of them. We're going to look at all of them. But last mile delivery, we're going to look at what's running around our distribution centers. Can we uh, eliminate emissions from that? And then, of course, the long haul, the big emitters. And, and for the long haul, certainly compressed natural gas, RNG, is really in its sweet spot because the energy content is very high so we can extend the range. One of the things that fleets suffer from is drivers. Drivers are hard to get. You look at most of your fleet commercials that you hear on the radar right now are, are driver retention and recruiting drivers. To go to a technology that gives you half the range or considerably less the range or I need more assets to cover the same route miles is a problem. Well, let me ask you about that because NGVA did a study back in December of 2020, I guess it was now, um, 
on transit, and we found that natural gas, and we compiled reports and studies from other third-party sources, right, mm -hmm. federal government reports even, um, they found that natural gas buses are more affordable, reliable, have a greater environmental impact, that battery electric vehicle, when you replace a diesel for a BEV, it's never a one-to-one -one replacement, yeah. and it had trouble meeting some of those service needs. And early adopters didn't always um, acknowledge that or calculate that in their TCO. So how does this impact um, from a one-to-one -one replacement yeah, that's a great question for too. freighting? Especially in freight and, and heavy duty transport, to have not a one-to-one -one ratio, which you do with renewable natural gas, certainly with the Cummins 15 liter engine and that coming out now and having the ability to have the horsepower requirements and torque requirements for the, those sleeper applications and long haul applications, it truly is a one, one for one. I take a diesel out, I put a renewable natural gas vehicle onto the road, I don't need 1.5 or 1 mm -hmm. 1.6, it is a true one for one replacement versus the other technologies and where they're at today. Not only is it the technology that'll evolve and we're, it's evolving very quickly, but there's a lot of infrastructure and electric grids and hydrogen infrastructure that needs to be put in place over the next decades to support it in heavy duty transport. It's absolutely gonna come from passenger car through light commercial vehicle, medium duty, but that heavy duty transport, and you saw in the one graph that I showed, looking out even in 2040, they're thinking that you know the internal combustion engine on very clean sources has a foreseeable life. Well, and that one for one ratio is very important. And so that brings me to a question for you then, Ashley. When we're talking about um, advancing, all these states are advancing clean transport rules, and you, mm -hmm. you went through what's going on in Europe and several states in the US, but almost every US state has also adopted some really aggressive clean electricity rules, right? For instance, pledging to be fully renewable within the next 25 years or so. And I, I've got some data, uh, some f figures, because California says it's gonna be 60% renewable by 2030, 2030, and 100% by 2045. Not to be outdone, I have to throw this in. My home state of New York says, we're gonna be 70% renewable by 2030, 100 by 2040. And then you have states like Hawaii that says, we're gonna be 100% by 2045. But right now, 66% of its electric grid, it's generated by dirty fuel oil. So how does this compound, how do all of these different big audacious goals, how do they meet them and the whole benefit of a battery electric system is that it's running on 100% renewable power. Where are we going? So I think the, the question there is, is it doable? And the answer is mm -hmm. it's not doable without RNG. It, it, it's just not. There's there's many challenges with, ele with electric. And it, like you said, in order for electric vehicles to be truly zero emission, the energy must come from renewable sources. And that's solar, that's wind, maybe water. And that's not happening today. The infrastructure is not built out. The sources are limited. And then what about the cost, right? Um, battery electric vehicles, they need massive amounts of funding to build out not only the generation and the transmission, but also the subsidies to, the, to pay for these kind of the higher cost of those actual vehicles. And RNG doesn't rely on any of that. RNG, we have production. We, the, it's a production of a carbon negative fuel today. We have transmission. There are over 2.6 mi million miles of pipeline and mobile pipe, and we have our mobile pipeline capacity as well. And then we have a mature network of fuelers and service suppliers across North America to dispense this with over 1,600 locations across the country. So I think the answer there is to, in order to achieve these goals, that there must be a significant play and reliance on RNG because it's available, it's scalable, and it's, it's economically feasible today. And it's here now. It's here now. Eric, detractors will often say there's just not enough RNG supply available to meet this heavy duty need. Your report found otherwise. Yeah, the, from a biomass standpoint, I would say that renewable natural gas available today is limited, right? Because there's not enough production. But from a biomass, the source of where, where the market could potentially get it, there's plenty of biomass available. And I don't want to you know, misconstrue anything that the study found that we need all of that. Less than 10% of that needs to be accessed, converted into RNG to support the figures that we showed, a 14% adoption rate by 2030, which is 50,000 heavy duty transport vehicles running on renewable natural gas. Less than 10% has to be accessed in North America. Mm -hmm. Pretty exciting. Karen, we have some questions from we do. folks. We have some questions in from the audience, and I just want to respond to a request that the, um, if you wanted to look back at the presentation while you're um, forming your questions, you can find it at ngvamerica.org. Um, in the resource center. So you'll find the presentation there if you need to refer to it. Um, we have a, a, one question here, and it's about the situation in the Ukraine. Mm. Um, it's a horrible humanitarian crisis, but it's also destabilizing the economy and wreaking havoc on global energy markets. 
How does RNG used as a motor fuel insulate fleets from geopolitical influences and fluctuating energy prices that might affect other clean fuel alternatives? So I open that to the yeah, team here. Yeah, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, I shared you know, some information there going back to 2011 on the volatility of diesel uh, versus natural gas. And it's unfortunate the situation we're in, but, it, but it's an example of reoccurring volatility that we see, whether it be socioeconomic um, over the last 10 years, certainly. And crude oil is drastically affected by that, and pump prices are drastically affected. And if you look at the, the breakdown of comp compressed natural gas at the pump versus diesel at the pump, depending on state and location, diesel, the, the raw commodity of crude oil, represents about 50 to 70 percent of the pump price, meaning when there's fluctuations globally and crude, crude oil goes from $71 a barrel to $104 a barrel over a very short period of time, you see pump prices skyrocket. Compressed natural gas, once again, depending on the state and location, it's anywhere from 20 to 29% of the pump price is actually the raw commodity. So there can be fluctuations you know, globally on uh, the raw commodity, but it doesn't impact the pump price nearly as much so it insulates. That's why you saw the black line on that graph being much more steady over a 10-year period of time. It's unfortunate the situation we're in. Mm -hmm. However, it does allow the fleet to say, okay, I've got a, a deviation of you know, plus or minus five, six percent that is historical. I can run my fleet and understand the return on investment. And the one thing I would add, just that I mentioned earlier, is that it is a domestically sourced um, resource, that it is produced in North America, it can be produced in every state. We all have waste, we have a waste crisis, and it, that is all within kind of the confines of North America so that it's not subject to these other geopolitical influences such as this, the unfortunate situation in with the Ukraine. Very good. Okay, um, going to another question. Um, how much more expensive is RNG compared to CNG? Once again, I'll just take a crack at the pump and then you can, you can comment. Um, from a pump standpoint, we see, depending on the state, it varies greatly. Uh, California is quite aggressive, so there's good pricing, but we see anywhere from uh, 85 cents on the low up to $1.50, $2 improvement. That's at the public station. When you have private infrastructure, tech, typically they'll negotiate um, deals with the gas companies and be considerably lower than what you would pay in a public pump. I would add, I'm, you may have some thoughts too, but so there are other types of kind of incentive programs and things like that that help kind of offset that premium that could be associated with RNG. Um, we have the alternative fuel tax credit that's been in place for many years that we're trying to get a five-year extension on that, we, I mean, it, 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 I guess, sunsetted at the end of 2021, but we expect to be extended hopefully for, for five years, which is the longest it's ever been extended. Um, so there's there's tax credits, and, and like I said, there's these kind of incentive programs and these traded commodities that, that help offset any sort sort of premium that could be attached to, to RNG. And I think what's interesting is that um, those fuelers in our fueler members are making a very drastic commitment to transitioning all of the natural gas in the motor fuel space to renewable sources. Um, last year, we were a majority. The majority fuel was RNG at 53%. We expect to have numbers within the next three to four weeks on what it looks like for 2021. Uh, we think it'll be greatly expanding in states like California that have a low carbon fuel standard. Last year it was 92%. 92%. Yeah. So our members are making a commitment to completely decarbonizing the fuel at their dispensers um, by 80% by, by basically 2030 and 100% by 2050. Those are fantastic targets, fantastic. Um, another question, um, as Scania is releasing um, the new 13 liter engine, do you believe others in Europe will move to the um, natural gas platform? Hydrogen also seems to be a model for Europe at the moment. Yeah, I'll, uh, it certainly is, but yeah, certainly Europe, like I said, is actually leading North America on heavy duty truck adoption. You have Scania, Iveco, that both have fantastic natural gas platforms with their own engines uh, installed. You have most of the OEMs over there that'll have natural gas transit platforms. Um, so all in all, between transit and uh, heavy duty truck, there are 13, 14,000 natural gas vehicles going into the European market. MAN, Iveco, Scania, um, Mercedes, all of them having offerings in that market. The other thing I would add from the from the regulatory side, from an investment standpoint, there's also the taxon, which I, I didn't mention. I don't want to spend too much time on the EU, but there's the taxonomy in the in the EU that pushes investment, for which which will impact what OEMs do. There's also the uh, it's called Red um, Renewable Energy Directive that is pushing investment, and and I think the OEMs are seeing this, and they're seeing this kind of regulatory support um, from an investment standpoint that is supporting the adoption of these new engines as well. 
In, in the second part of the question on hydrogen, yes, we are seeing a lot of hydrogen activity. It's a lot of prototype activity in regards to both hydrogen fuel cell, but also hydrogen ICE, internal combustion engine in North America. Cummins has announced that they'll have a platform available, and we're seeing it in Europe as well with various OEMs. I, I think, Karen, um, so many of the major uh, engine manufacturers, heavy-duty truck manufacturers, are based in Europe, so they've got some really interesting technologies that they are deploying here. And between the regulatory mm -hmm. situation in the United States and markets, uh, environmental, social governments, uh, the push from Wall Street, as well as push from consumers that want more sustainable freighting, mm -hmm. they want products delivered to their homes sustainably, as, as that market continues to grow on all those fronts, it's going to push these manufacturers to bring those products that they're developing elsewhere here and deployed in the United States. Great. And that's an, uh, also a good lead into the next question is, um, can RNG really make a sustainable impact by 2030 in reducing GHG emissions? Well, I can, I, there's two points that I want to make earlier, and that, that question brings it right back, which is perfect. So the answer is yes, and I think it's the only fuel that can do so. And that's, that was our, our kind of big takeaway here. But at least in California, where, where we are now, um, there's been two what we're calling indirect source rules, um, where there's the warehouse, warehouse indirect source rule, where the air district, South Coast for us, the South Coast Air Quality Management District, is seeing that these targets are not being achieved with the, with, with the status quo. And so they're pushing for the use of RNG to achieve these, these different kind of, um, they're now requirements, they're, they're uh, laws, laws that they have to comply with, with the use of RNG. And then the, the ports is another example, that they just started this rulemaking um, for, it'll, it'll mean, take it a year or so, but to get an indirect source rule in place that will utilize RNG because it is the, the fuel that will allow us to achieve those emissions reductions by 2030. The other fuels may be further down the road, but in, in the near term that we're mm -hmm. talking about, RNG is the way to do it. RNG now. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, even Karen, in states like here in California that have an LCFS program, they're tracking every fuel, right? Yeah. So they know all the pathways. And the only fuel right now that is carbon negative is renewable natural gas. Right. Uh, remember, renewable electricity will only be zero. So when I said at the beginning that you're not just avoiding emissions, you're actually working to take them out, you're basically getting double duty with, natural, with renewable natural gas by taking a problem, creating it to a green energy asset, and then displacing diesel and all that carbon at the same time. And here in California in 2020 was the first year that fleets that were, were running bio CNG had a negative carbon outcome for the year already, two years ago. So to quantify that, which is important, <laughs> right? What does that mean? Okay, that's a lot of words, but what does it mean? The study concluded that if renewable natural gas was adopted at the full potential that I showed in the presentation between now and 2030, it's the equivalent of one year heavy duty truck sales not happening. Those vehicles not going mm. on the market. Mm. Pretty, well, signi pretty significant. Changes. Climate change is cumulative, right? right. Early, early results today compound over time. So this may fit in with this, but you know, in what types of fleet patterns would, uh, would RNG work best? Heavy duty long haul. <laughs> Absolutely heavy duty long haul. And when I say that, when we, when we look in this marketplace, typically the day cab route that's 400 to 500 miles today. Uh, the other technologies that are really going to struggle to get there, diesel does it easily, uh, renewable natural gas does it easily. Where you really start to stretch the envelope now with the sleeper operation is where you got slip seating operations, 200 to 250,000 trucks going into the marketplace per year with the 15 liter or dual combo system can easily hit 1,200 miles. Hmm. So that is the sweet spot. There is not another alt fuel technology that will be ready before 2030 in mass that could support that. And I think that readiness is a, is a key point there, but because like what's ready now, I mean, drayage is a good, in our local, at the local ports, drayage is a good sweet spot for it today, because that's where um, there's just some technologies that are just lagging a little bit, and, and RNG is, is uh, available right now. <laughs> and, and it's important to understand, too, we're talking about not science projects, not mm. putting out dozens or hundreds, or even a few thousand. That doesn't impact climate. We're talking about repeatedly tens of thousands of units going into the marketplace that's where renewable natural gas is ready. And a lot of our fleet members are middle mile. They're on fixed routes. Um, so they know every day they're running three, 400 miles maybe per day. Um, and it gives them that reliability, that predictability, and the same fueling, refueling experience as diesel. I think that's important. Yeah. There's no, a lot of our member fleet members don't have time for hours of charging. Mm -hmm. There's no downtime. Um, natural gas, renewable natural gas gives them that same fueling experience and time frame. And um, another question from an audience member is any 
Um, if, if there's going to be any solution um, to be adopted today, um, can it, let's see, in order for any solution to be adopted, can today's fleets operate RNG profitably versus diesel and other clean energy solutions in mass? And I think we, we mentioned it in the presentation, but maybe worth, bears worth repeating. Yeah, at a high level, certainly the more fuel that you burn, the better the ROI is. And it, it, you have the fuel savings, but now we're starting to see fleets that keep their assets for four or five years. That five-year-old, six-year-old diesel experience where you get into after treatment systems that have to be replaced, the cost per mile on the maintenance side is quite high. So now the, the longer experience that you have with natural gas, it really starts to get into its sweet spot in addition to the fuel savings. So yeah, it's a very positive ROI, certainly with the fuel spread that we see today, um, certainly helps that as well. Excellent. Um, and I have one more question. Um, yeah, is infrastructure and distribution in place to support immediate mass adoption? Yeah. Yes, and I actually want to kind of juxtapose that with um, other alternative fuel options right now. So we, here we are in California, and we've heard of the rolling blackouts. The, I mean, we know in Texas mm -hmm. the winter crisis that happened last year. We, we struggle um, from a resiliency, reliability standpoint, and I think RNG is very unique in that regard, that it is just like going, I mean, there, there's no shortage of supply. Any truck can go and, and fill up w with its you know, normal fueling patterns and so forth, and we don't have that volatility and that um, kind of nervousness around fuel supply when it comes to RNG. Well, and where some of these mythical technologies that aren't commercially available are deployed yet, natural gas has been, right, um, through geologic natural gas for decades. And so we do have a mature infrastructure network of suppliers and stations across the U.S. Could we build that out? Absolutely. We'll continue to build that out as we have fleets. But I think it's really important to recognize that it's a resilient it's a redundant, the redundancies are built in. And so when you need to fuel that vehicle, you're able to fuel that vehicle. And you mentioned blackouts and the like, but even after storms, um, we have dozens of situations where uh, systems have gone down, grids have gone down, availability of diesel even to get back into that storm territory or area has, has gone down. Natural gas vehicles have continued to perform, provide relief recovery, delivery of supplies and, and first responders. We have just a few more questions that have come in, so we're going to try and move through these to get through them all. Okay. If we don't make it, we'll email the answers to Great. these people. But um, so, um, would love your opinion on long-term externalities surrounding the BEV market. For example, mining lithium, disposing of huge batteries, etc. Yeah, it's an issue, right? I mean, <laughs> what what is end of life for the battery? There's a lot of different things that you know. Certainly, we're looking at, and others are looking at in the marketplace to say, okay, when it's served, when the battery pack has served its life. Uh, in the vehicle, there's secondary and, and tertiary markets that we can put them into. Uh, there's certainly opportunities there, but at, at some point you get to end of true end of life, and there's a lot of different things that that the market's looking at. But it's an issue in the mining of the the cobalt and the, and the precious metals that are involved with that um, is certainly a, a topic from an ESG standpoint, as well as you know our systems. Like I said earlier, we're looking at different extended life situations that we can extend the life of our uh, fuel systems as well. Good. We'll just keep moving along here. Great. So, um, what is it, rapid fire? Right yeah. There. What about the Volvo product in Europe? Is that mm -hmm. a solution for RNG? The, the global product the, in Europe. The Volvo. Oh, Volvo. 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 And well, a, a member of ours, Westport Fuel uh, Systems, um, has worked with Volvo for years on that product. And I think you'll be hearing some news from Westport, um, just as we talked about before. Other technologies coming in. I think you might hear some exciting news from Westport soon. And then um, I think this is the last question from the audience that we'll have time for, but CNG versus LNG. Mm. Will um, heavy duty long haul grow preference for LNG? You want to crack at that? I can take a technology. Answer. I think we'll see huge um, increased interest in LNG when it comes to some of the marine and rail, maybe some of those off-road markets. Not so sure here in the U.S. about on-road. Yeah, I mean, certainly we have good infrastructure, pipeline infrastructure for, for compressed, the compressed solutions, and that's certainly taken off. The, Euro, the European market is very different. You don't have the space to package energy, so LNG has really taken off in that market for that. And I would just, the last, just to add from the, the LNG infrastructure in Europe, they have, as from a regular, like the EU Commission has specifically recognized the use and the role of LNG for the medium and heavy duty sector in Europe. So I think it will continue to have a, a strong trajectory there. Perfect. We're gonna, that's all we have for questions, <laughs> but now I'll turn it over to you, Dan, to wrap it up. Great, thank you. Thanks, Karen, and thank you, Eric and Ashley, for your insight, your outlook, your involvement today. We greatly appreciate Hexagon Agility's leadership. 
NGV America is proud to captain the crusade to decarbonize the heavy-duty transportation sector. Reminder that you can access today's presentation 24-7 at our online resource center at ngvamerica.org. The race to zero is on. You can start now. RNG is how. Thanks for being with us.